Now we move on to James Clerk Maxwell and his equations of electromagnetism. Electromagnetism at the end of the 19th century concluded that light waves travel at a fixed speed in a yet undiscovered medium called the luminiferous ether. This fixed ether speed was discovered by Maxwell to be the speed of light. Let's see where that came from. First, let's look at Coulomb's inverse square law, or as it's called in undergraduate ENM classes all around the world, simply Coulomb's law. It calculates the amount of force experienced by one charge at rest due to a second charge also at rest. The force drops off as the distance square between the charges and is directed radially between them. Defined in 1785 by French physicist Charles Augustine de Coulomb, it's important to note that this law was experimentally observed and measured. In fact, all of the laws we're about to look at are founded on experiment and observation. Because it allowed the quantification of about how much electric charge was on or in a particle, Coulomb's law was essential to the development of the theory of electromagnetism and can be considered its starting point. For our current discussion, we note that this force has a conversion factor, epsilon zero, the vacuum permittivity. Epsilon sub zero is an experimentally defined quantity that converts a pair of charges and a pair of distances into a force. We see that 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught has the value of 9 times 10 to the 9 meters per farad. Meters per farad has other meanings in SI units, and it's the same as a Newton meter squared per coulomb squared, as is obvious from the equation itself. But the SI unit for electromagnetism is the ampere, not the coulomb. And if we translate it to that unit, we see that it's a Newton per amp squared times a speed squared. And that speed will come up as very important later. In 1820, Danish physicist Hans Christian Ørsted discovered that an electric current creates a magnetic field circling around that current. He noticed it as he moved a compass around a wire carrying a current, and the needle moved, turned such that it always was perpendicular to the wire. This sparked a huge amount of research. He showed this to uh, André Marie Ampère, who went to do many, many experiments that clearly showed the relationship between an electrical current and a magnetic field, culminating in the experimentally derived Ampère force law in 1825, which you see here. This relates the force per unit length of wire to the product of the currents in the wires divided by the distance between them. Because the left-hand side of the equation isn't just force, but force per unit length of wire, then the conversion factor mu naught then must have units like force per squared amp. This is the vacuum magnetic permeability, and it quantifies the strength of the magnetic field induced by an electric current. Officially, mu naught is about 1.3 times 10 to the minus sixth henrys per meter, which of course is translatable to other SI units as needed. In 1820, Jean-Baptiste Biot and Félix Savard discovered empirically their Biot-Savard law, which describes and characterizes the magnetic field generated by a constant electric current. Again, we have the permeability of free space mu naught. This again is a conversion factor which is experimentally measured. With these equations, Maxwell had what he needed to begin the work of electromagnetism. For those college students out there, the Lorentz force law, which explicitly relates the force on a charge due to an electric field and a time-varying magnetic field, was derived by Hendrik Lorentz in 1895, well after Maxwell's work. This equation is often used today as the fundamental definition of the electric and magnetic fields. The force experienced by a charge Q is dependent on the electric field E acting upon it. If it's moving with velocity V, then it also experiences a force due to a moving through some magnetic field B. Coulomb's law and the Biot-Savart law and the Ampere law all combine together to shove that charge around. However, this force law was only hinted at by James Clerk Maxwell's groundbreaking work, and it had to wait. From 1855, Maxwell studied and wrote about electricity and magnetism at Marischal College in Aberdeen, King's College in London, and at Cambridge. In 1861, he published On Physical Lines of Force, where he reduced all the current knowledge about electricity and magnetism into a set of 20 differential equations in 20 variables. Maxwell showed that his 20 equations predict the existence of waves of oscillating magnetic and electric fields that travel through empty space. 
Further, the speed of the waves could be predicted from simple electrical experiments using the data currently available at the time. In so doing, Maxwell obtained a velocity of about 310 million meters per second. In 1865, he wrote in another paper his growing confidence that light and electricity and magnetism were one and the same. Quote, the agreement of the results seems to show that light and magnetism are affections of the same substance and that light is an electromagnetic disturbance propagated through the field according to electromagnetic laws. His famous 20 equations, now fully developed in their modern form of these four partial differential equations, first appeared in his textbook, A Treatise on Electricity and Magnetism, in 1873. Now let's go through each one of these in turn. First, we look at Gauss's law. Carl Friedrich Gauss derived this relationship empirically from experiments in 1835. It can be summarized as, the net electric flux through any hypothetical closed surface is equal to the electric charge enclosed within that surface, divided by epsilon naught. Here, del dot E is the divergence of the electric field, epsilon naught is the vacuum permittivity, and rho is the total volume charge density, charge per unit volume. In Maxwell's time, epsilon naught was measured and known by relating electric charges in Coulomb's law, knowing the amount of electric charge between two point-like objects and somehow measuring the force between them. Strictly speaking, the value and representation of this constant has changed through time as various unit standards have been adopted and changed, but that's a side note. We'll keep the vacuum permittivity in mind for later. Next, the oddly named Gauss's Law for Magnetism. It states that the magnetic field B has a divergence equal to zero. This is equivalent to stating that magnetic monopoles don't exist, which is usually how this equation is named. This idea for the non-existence of magnetic monopoles originated in 1269, yeah, that's right, 1269, by Petrus Peregrinus de Metacor. In the early 1800s, Michael Faraday reintroduced this law, and it subsequently made its way into Maxwell's uh, electromagnetic equations, as you see here. Gauss occasionally gets this one named after him, too, because of the similarity to the previous equation. But there exists electric charges, right? So why not magnetic charges or magnetic monopoles? Well before Maxwell's time, it was well known that when a bar magnet is broken into two pieces, you get two small magnets, each with their own north and south poles. And this is explained by Ampere's current law. The bar magnet on the atomic level is made of many little circular current rings, each of which is essentially a magnetic dipole. Since a small current ring always generates an equivalent magnetic dipole, there's no way of generating a free magnetic charge. That is, there's no way to break off just the north pole of the magnet. Suffice it to say that no magnetic monopoles have ever been found in any experiments, and not for lack of trying. If magnetic monopoles were ever found, this law would of course have to be modified. There are reasons why particle physicists have hypothesized that they must exist, specifically in the supersymmetry breaking at the time of the universe's inflationary epoch. This should have created a huge number of them, but we see zero. I'll talk more about this in later chapters in the series, but if you want to learn more, go look at my cosmology videos in my introductory astronomy section to learn more about magnetic monopoles and their impact in the early universe. But I digress. Let's look at the third equation, Faraday's law of induction. It can be read as, the electromotive force around a closed path is equal to the negative of the time rate of change of the magnetic flux enclosed by that path. In 1831, Michael Faraday created an experiment that demonstrated electromagnetic induction. He wrapped two wires around opposite ends of an iron ring. He described that when current began to flow in one wire, a sort of wave would travel through the iron ring, causing some electrical effect on the other wire. He measured a transient current, which he called a wave of electricity, on one side's wire when he connected or disconnected the other side's wire to a battery. This process made a change in the magnetic flux and induced a current. He created a concept called lines of force to describe and explain it. At the time, scientists rejected Faraday's theoretical idea of a line of force, mainly because Faraday did not formulate it mathematically, but only geometrically. 
This most important exception to this disdain was, of course, James Clerk Maxwell, who used Faraday's idea as the basis for all his theories. Maxwell summarized it in his third equation. Incidentally, this was Maxwell's starting point into electrodynamics, where he discussed at length in his 1855 paper on Faraday's lines of force. The fourth and final equation of Maxwell's laws is an extension of Ampere's 1825 experimentally observed law. Ampere's version of this equation determines the magnetic field associated with a given current, or the current associated with a given magnetic field. However, Maxwell's inspiration was to add a second term, the displacement current, that epsilon dE dt. He reasoned that a current, J, was the same as a changing electric field, perhaps due to a burst of charges moving along. This critical insight allowed him to then hypothesize that light was a form of an electromagnetic wave using a time-varying electric field. Now let's follow along in Maxwell's footsteps and derive his stunning assertion that light is an electromagnetic wave that can travel through empty space. First, we're going to take Faraday's law and we're going to apply the curl to it. Next, we note that in free space or vacuum, there won't be a current, so there won't be anything for J. With that idea, we use Ampere's law with only the time-varying electric field component. Plugging this in, we see that in the second line that we've introduced both the vacuum permittivity E sub naught and the permeability of free space mu sub naught into an equation that only has a bunch of vector stuff and the electric field E. Specifically, on the left, there are only spatial partial derivatives, and on the right, we only have partial derivatives with respect to time. Now, the product of these two constants has the units of inverse speed squared because we have to convert times into distances twice. And since mu sub naught and epsilon sub naught are constant, so are their product. And then we can define C to be the speed of the electromagnetic disturbance propagation. This was Maxwell's great discovery, that all electromagnetic interactions travel at this speed, and that this speed was identical to the speed of light. The speed of light was well known from contemporary experiments, so this great assertion marks him as one of the great geniuses of science. So, how does light travel? Well, we have a curl of a curl of an electric field, and this can be readily simplified through vector identities. There are two parts to this. One looks like Gauss's law, and the other looks like two partial derivatives, exactly like Poisson's law from the previous chapter, a Laplacian of spatial derivatives. For the first part, in empty space, there are no charges or currents, so that part's zero. And with that, only the Laplacian term remains. And for this, I simplify the Laplacian to one dimension for our pedagogical ease. That equation in the fourth step is a standard wave equation that propagates at speed c with a typical wave equation shown at the bottom. When Maxwell found this solution, he was convinced that all electromagnetic phenomena were the same thing, were composed of waves, and all went at the speed of light. Remember that mu naught and epsilon naught had good measurements at the time, and the reciprocal square root of their product was so close to the value of speed of light that was known at the time by the experiments of Fizeau and Foucault that he found it too compelling to be false. Maxwell, of course, was proven correct. And this making this leap to demonstrate the measurable connection between light and electromagnetism is one of the greatest accomplishments of classical physics. Finally, and critically, his great work was founded on another idea, that is, light's propagation required a medium for the waves. Maxwell dubbed this medium the luminiferous ether, it was a commonplace and seemingly necessary idea that every wave phenomenon required a medium through which it could travel. His work codified the idea of a luminiferous ether, which was now the new hot area of physics for the last part of the 19th century.